But in this entire history of degrading humans to something merely physical, there always seemed to be one step missing. The missing link that connects the merely physical and explainable world of our sciences and the seemingly divine, inexplicable world of life. After all, how could evolution give rise to something that is aware of its own existence? This missing link is consciousness. Consciousness is one of these topics that have plagued humanity for thousands of years. And as I already said, when unanswerable questions don't leave humans alone, they make up some myth or concept that can explain it. And this is where most of our attempts at answering consciousness come from. Again, I think the most prominent one in the Western world is a soul. You feel like a thing trapped in an animal's body because you are a soul trapped in an animal's body. Descartes thought this, and I think most people today think something vaguely similar. Jains in India, for example, believe that every single thing, ranging from stones to animals, has a soul and can thus experience pain and suffering. And you know, I get it. It's fascinating how something like conscious experience can arise out of sheer matter. It seems almost impossible that there's nothing metaphysical about this. And to be fair, science hasn't been very helpful either. Consciousness is a topic that has actually been avoided by most scientists because it is deemed to be too philosophical. I actually recently asked someone from the Max Planck Institute if they are working on a theory of consciousness. And she said, no, because we're not a philosophical institution. So this should go to show you how little we know about this phenomena. That is basically the most essential thing about us. However, there are some very basic theories that try to explain consciousness on a material level. For example, there is the higher order theory that states that consciousness is only the brain's ability to know of its own existence. Others believe that consciousness is produced by some special cell in our brain, namely pyramidal neurons. But the most general and widely accepted belief is that consciousness somehow arises as a result of the complexity in our brains, meaning that it is either the number of neurons, the way in which they are structured, or both that causes us to be conscious. In fact, this belief in complexity is so well established that almost all of the current research works off of this. That being said, nothing interesting has really come out of science so far. Nothing that gives a satisfying explanation while staying in the materialistic world. Nothing except one theory. This is a picture of a Chinese woman who is missing the cerebellum, a part of the brain that coordinates some of our basic movements. Aside from her moving seemingly drunken, she was perfectly lucid. Her consciousness was not impaired by this part of the brain missing. Problem being, the cerebellum contains about 70% of the 100 billion neurons that we have. What this implies is that it cannot simply be the sheer number of neurons that gives rise to our consciousness. And this is where the integrated information theory comes into play. This is where the fun begins. The Integrated Information Theory, or IIT for short, states that how conscious we are is directly related to a mathematical value called phi. We don't really know why this connection exists. Maybe it's one of those fundamentals of the universe, like gravity. But that doesn't matter for now, because phi in itself is interesting enough. As the name of the theory implies, the complexity phi is calculated through the information in a system and the integration thereof. And I know that all of this sounds kind of complicated, but I think it's actually easier to understand than you think. Information here is the same you already know. It is ones and zeros, gate open or not, or neuron firing or not. Your brain maintains a lot of information because it contains a lot of neurons, 100 billion to be exact, that either fire or don't. But what is way more interesting here is the way in which this information interacts with itself. Integration is the ability of information to travel through the brain so that it can be used in other brain regions. Essentially, integration means the bandwidth through which information can be transported. Think of it like resistance between neurons and brain regions. Or the ability of a group of neurons to causally affect the firing of another group of neurons. To make this a bit clearer, this is a study done in 2004. In it, patients' brains were stimulated by a TMS system, 
meaning an electromagnetic impulse was sent through their brain and mapped. And these are the results. When there is high integration, an electromagnetic impulse travels far and unhindered through the brain. It reverberates freely and long, implying that there is a lot of talking between brain regions. This means that information can travel freely through the brain. On the other hand, when there is low integration, the impulse is fairly short-lived. It doesn't travel very far and subsides rather quickly. This means that information, like the electromagnetic impulse, has a hard time getting around. And this is where the first mind blow, at least for me, happens. As you can see, both of these are human brains. So why is it that this one has a high integration of information and this one has a low integration of information? Well, this one is awake and this one is in a dreamless sleep. When we are asleep, the integration in our brain becomes less. Brain regions stop talking to each other and neurons don't transport impulses as well anymore. Meaning essentially that it gets harder for information to get around. This means that the mathematical complexity phi of the system we call our brain lowers. And because consciousness equals phi, it fades during sleep. In fact, when stimulated by TMS, the brains of unconscious patients, like coma patients, have shown similar patterns of integration as those of asleep patients. However, coma patients that were experiencing locked-in syndrome, meaning that they were conscious but just couldn't move, showed patterns of integration similar to those of awake people. Now, I personally find this entire theory super fascinating. It answers a lot of the questions Reddit could never answer me. For example, the way general anesthesia works is by somehow cutting the flow of information through the brain, thus making the complexity phi of the system lower and you unconscious. But this entire theory is full of such fun little answers to big mysteries. For example, we now know that consciousness is a gradient. It probably starts with the smallest of all animals, works itself up the evolutionary ladder through mammals and ends up with us. But consciousness is also a gradient for you during the day. For example, sometimes when you get up in the morning, it happens that the unconscious, low integration state of an asleep brain has not yet quite changed into the high conscious integration state of an awake brain. And this feeling of drowsy lucidity is probably precisely what animals with a lower brain complexity feel like, like dolphins or dogs, or maybe even what the complex system called the internet feels like. Now at this point, it is only more than fair to acknowledge that extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. I have spent a lot of time reading into this theory, and I have in no way any means of making a fair assessment of its validity, because I'm not a neuroscientist. But I want to be intellectually honest here. From what I have read, the general consensus is that this theory is not perfect yet. There is still heated debate about its details. But people like Christoph Koch, who is kind of as credible as it gets in neuroscience, have already adopted the IIT in their work. And so far, the evidence seems to confirm that the IIT is correct. It has even found medical use already, for example, to determine if coma patients are conscious. And with good results. In the future, the IIT will most likely incorporate some elements from another theory of consciousness, the global workspace theory. But so far, almost all of the IIT's predictions that have been tested in reality have been proven to be true. It also has a remarkable explanative power that can make sense of previous medical mysteries. Take the earlier example. Scientists have observed that if you remove the cerebral cortex from a human, it's basically game over. No consciousness left in a body while at the same time, removing the cerebellum is no big deal, even though the cerebellum contains about 70 billion neurons and the cortex only about 16 billion. The most obvious difference between those two brain regions is that the cerebral cortex is largely made up of pyramidal type neurons, while the cerebellum is largely made up of Purkinje type neurons. Usually, the explanation ended here, and scientists just believed that pyramidal neurons for some reason produce most of our consciousness, while other types of neurons simply produce almost none. And here's where the IIT comes in. The two kinds of cells produce different amounts of consciousness because of the geometrical structure. As the name implies, the pyramidal cells are connected in three dimensions, making them form complex and well-connected networks, through which information can pass through easily making it easy for it to spread through the brain and interact with other brain regions. 
On the other hand, the Purkinje type cell is literally a textbook example for bad connectivity. Its axons connect to other cells only on a 2D plane, making the Purkinje cell form layer upon layer of cells that extend millions of cells far, but only on one dimension, forming no connections to the adjacent layers. So the cerebellum produces almost no consciousness despite its ridiculous amounts of neurons because of its very two-dimensional structure, which makes it impossible for information to get around. Now that we've got that out of the way, let's talk a bit more about the really fascinating parts of this theory. In the easiest way I can put it, conscious systems like your brain are built of many parts. Together, they form your consciousness. However, if you separate these parts by making the connections between them worse or by just cutting them entirely, so essentially stopping information from getting around, these parts who previously formed one system now form their own separate conscious systems, meaning in short, consciousness can be split. And this has already been observed. As always, the culprits are doctors in the 50s. A common treatment for epilepsy back then was just cutting the bridge between the two brain halves. By doing this, they essentially split the brain into two separate systems. And what happened? The two different sides of your body started behaving differently, almost like they were different people. While one side started dressing up, the other one was undressing. Alien hand syndrome occurred, where one hand tried to keep the other one from doing something. There seemed to be two people in one body. And guess what? The person behaved like two separate people because it now was two separate beings two separate consciousnesses. Usually what happens after some time is that the body starts behaving normally again because the left hemisphere established its dominance and became the only entity controlling the body again. The other brain half just started riding along, forever as a prisoner in its own body. Some scientists managed to establish communication with the right brain half that was just as much a person as the other brain half. And what happened? Nothing. It didn't scream as soon as it had the opportunity to. It doesn't seem to be concerned with being a prisoner in its own body. But that is probably because it still felt like it was in control. What usually happens with split brain patients is that whenever one body half does something, the other brain half just makes up a explanation why. When the right brain half picks up a rubber duck and the left side is asked why, it will just say, oh, because it looked really interesting although it had nothing to do with the action. Experience has shown that in general, whenever your body does something that you yourself did not actively choose to do, it will still feel like it was a decision made from free will. So although the right brain half will have no actual control after some time, it will still feel like it does, because this is how our brains work. This then poses the question, what if there is something else in your brain right now that also makes decisions for you, only making you believe it was free choice? What is free will anyway? If you're brave enough and curious as to what it feels like to have a split brain, you can also temporarily split your consciousness by putting your corpus callosum, the bridge between your two brain halves, on ice, thus temporarily disabling it. It hasn't been done yet though, because that's what scientists would call hella dangerous. But it gets more fun. If you can split one system into multiple consciousnesses, you can also combine two systems. Once Neuralink is available and actually manages to create a sufficient bandwidth between two brains so that the mathematical complexity phi of the whole system is higher than that of the individual brains, their consciousness will snap and combine to become one. Maybe the Indian panpsychists were right all along. To take this to its logical extreme, maybe we'll even see planetary consciousnesses in the future. Now, the disturbing part, if everything else before that didn't shock you already, is that this whole theory undermines the notion of you. If your consciousness is not one continuous thing, why should you be? What if the only thing making you feel the same throughout your life is having access to your memories? Your consciousness ends when you fall asleep and re-emerges when you wake up. But if that is the case, where is the qualitative difference between that and dying, copying your memories and putting it into a brain simulation? Wouldn't that feel exactly the same as waking up? 
what happens when you 3D print an exact carbon copy of you. Both of you will be conscious and both of you will feel like the way you just a minute ago. All of this calculating, splitting and combining of consciousness brings with it something very, very dark. It takes a bit of the holiness from human life away. We are on the brink of a total collapse of everything we believe we are. And what comes after it will certainly not be pleasant.